How's it going, everybody? Burnout Alperson, Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio. It is March 21st, 2024, figure four, online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. We got a lot of news to get into here today, so let's get started. The lawsuit, TKO and UFC, was settled. $335 million will be paid out to former fighters. And as far as what the hell that means, we still don't have any idea, including the fighters. They don't know really what's going on. But it appears they will all be getting something. And I really don't even know what, because is it going to be split equally amongst everybody? Are higher paid fighters going to get more money? Isn't that what the whole thing is about? Shouldn't this really be like uh, you know, an equal amount paid out to everybody or... Per fight, what is everybody going to make that they had during that period? We don't have any answer to these questions. No, not I mean, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff that we're not going to know for another thirty or forty-five days. And I mean, the key, I think, one of the key things is that is it just a money settlement, or there were there other things agreed to? Because the only thing that's been released is the money figure, which is three hundred thirty-five million dollars, three hundred thirty-five million dollars. Which is, I mean, I was there the day the suit was filed because it was originally filed in San Jose before it got moved to Nevada. And, um, you know, I talked to all the lawyers and, you know, I've been in contact with uh, one of the lawyers pretty, pretty much. I mean, not regularly, but from time to time and, you know, talked to Kung Lee a few times on it and John Fitch and um, Carlos Newton the night of the the, the day this, the suit was filed, talked to him for a long time. So 10 years, go back 10 years. 2014 when this was filed if you would have told me 10 years ago this thing would be settled for 335 million dollars i'd go oh my god that's like insane yet today when the number came out it was almost like and i I think that this kind of was was the consensus it was like really that's all which tells you how much changed in the last 10 years as far as perception Maybe even the value of three hundred and thirty five million. <laughs> well, that and three. also, you know, in the last couple of years, people have been talking about anywhere from over a billion to three Multiple times billions. damages, five billion. And it comes out to three hundred thirty five million. So when you're when you're when you're saying it could be as much as five billion, then, yeah, yeah three hundred thirty five million sounds like well, it doesn't sound like that much. No. Yeah. I mean, it's really it's, it's a lot of money, obviously, but it's not. You know, because of the uh, size of the company now, it's not, um, you know, I mean, it's like they make that in profit, you know what I mean, in a year. It's, so it's like it's a year's profit, which is a lot, but it's it's not crippling by any means. No, um, and, and the other thing also is you're talking about this $335 million, you have to take percentages out at the beginning, and then the remainder is going to be split among 1,200 yeah. fighters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you're so, looking at maybe a little over a hundred thousand each. Okay, well, 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 okay, okay. It's 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 hundred eighty five thousand each. Um, if if it's all split equally, sure. Uh, um, which we don't know if it will or it won't. So the average fighter of these twelve hundred fighters, it's on, get hundred eighty five thousand. I mean, look, if you're a, that's a lot of money. I mean, it's not. You know, I mean, five billion split. Well, yeah, it's a lot of money. But then when you start to think about, okay, well, you know, some fighter may have had seven fights during that time. And then you think about, okay, how much extra do they make actually per fight if we take $185,000 and divide it by seven? I mean, they're really not making a lot more. Well, it's under fifty-five thousand dollars. It's, it's hey, listen, it's it's not it's, it's, nothing. Obviously, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 uh, certainly nobody would argue that the lawsuit wasn't worth it for. The plaintiffs, because you know, it's everyone's going to get one hundred eighty-five thousand. Yeah, they didn't. They, they didn't have to do anything. That, that they didn't. Yeah, that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And the lawyers, you know, I mean, the lawyers are going to end up with uh, about one hundred and twelve million. Um, and I don't know how many lawyers that's split in front of, but even if we just say ten, it's, it's eleven million. You know, each each lawyer, which you know, I mean, they've done ten years worth of work, and um, you know, at the end. You know, you end up with eleven million. I think every single one of them would go like it was worth it financially. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. So I mean, as far as that goes, at the same time, you know, the stock market, you know, the stock price. I mean, the the TKO stock uh, rose because they were fearing the worst. I mean, one of the reasons the stock price was what it was was because of the fear of this thing's going to court in April, 
and it could be a really bad verdict. I mean, it was a series of of um, situations. I mean, one of one of the things was is that if they had gone to trial, I mean, like and again, like you're talking about the fighters and the lawyers, it's like there's there's the chance, even though it looked good. Obviously, it looked good because TKO wouldn't have settled for this amount of money if it didn't look good. But there's a chance that the jury might have just said, hey, look, you signed these contracts and whatever. And then, you know, um, TKO would appeal it. So that's going to drag it out a couple more years. And to get the treble damages and go to the antitrust route, you're talking about almost starting from scratch and redoing. And that's many, many, many more years. So it was kind of like one of those things of, you could do it. You could keep it going. At the same time, you know, it's like you're you're getting handed a, a check. Now, if if there are more terms that come out, such as limiting the length of contracts and things like that, that could be a major change. I don't expect that's the case only because I know I saw the thing that Nate Corey, who was one of the plaintiffs, said, and he basically said, I mean, is paraphrasing what he said. It was essentially, yeah, he's another one who I've actually talked to during this thing, but or, or been, been in contact with during this thing. But the, um, it's it's like, it was the best that we were going to do, but we're not high fiving each other either. So that tells me that it was probably not there were probably not an agreement for material changes in the nature of contracting and things like that. I mean, one of the things they were really pushing for was. You know, one year limits on contracts. So guys would go into free agency more often and championships be like supposed real championships as opposed to company championships. So like if Francis Naganu is the heavyweight champion, let's just say, and he signs with the PFL as he did, um, he would still be world champion, but he would just defend there. Or you would have a thing where, let's say, um, Sean O'Malley and Marab Devalishvili have a big fight. That's a really big fight coming up. Um, you know, you could, you know, basically do the thing where, you know, the PFL, you know, because the PFL is the only real competition right now, you know, could go in there and, and, and outbid the UFC for that championship match and put it on pay per view and, and, you know, things like that, which would change, that would materially change the game a lot. I don't expect that there's anything that happened there just because uh, maybe, you know, again, um, I think we would, I don't know that we would hear about it because we can't hear about that for 30 to 45 days um, until everything is worked out. And there's still, the court still has to approve it, but I think that they will when it comes to that. And, um, you know, I mean, it was a very successful suit, um, but. You know, the idea of, of billions of dollars, which would have, you know, billions of dollars would have hurt badly, you know, especially if it's two or three billion or five billion or whatever. I mean, that would have been scary um, and would have killed the stock price and, 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 you know, for WWE and TKO and everything. And that didn't happen. And that's one of the reasons why they were willing to go so high to settle. The other aspect is, is that, OK, so this suit is done and, you know, you pretty much and it's it's both suits by the way because there was two suits there was the Kung Lee lawsuit and there's the Cajun Johnson lawsuit and they're both settled essentially with this the other question coming out of this is um what happens when it comes to WWE because we've already established this lawsuit uh, if they if they if somebody if they can gather Similar plaintiffs from WWE. Um, I mean, WWE has done more than UFC um, to hold back competition over the years. Now, that wasn't the only thing. And, and as far as, you know, as far as like the percentage of revenue that WWE pays, I mean, one of the things that, you know, they were suing over was that the percentage of revenue was so much lower than in real sports. Well, WWE's percentage of revenue that goes to the wrestlers is probably lower. It is it is lower than UFC's to the fighters. So that's there. The holding back of competition is there and probably more in WWE's case than I, I'm sure they've done a lot more. Now, they have not bought, like one of the things um, with UFC was that they bought WEC, which didn't really didn't mean anything because WEC wasn't that significant, but they did buy Pride, which was a 
very significant competition, although they were going to go out of business otherwise. And they bought Strike Force, which was also very significant competition. WWE really didn't buy anything other than WCW, um, which was very significant competition. And they acquired ECW in bankruptcy court. If they had bought ECW and bought WCW, we'd actually have an identical case here, too. Um, but I mean, as far as like things like holding them back from arenas or, or, um, you know, you know, keeping companies down by having exclusive with TV stations and all that, which UFC never did. I mean, they, like I said, they've done more. So what we've established is if lawyers look at this and I mean, like, uh, you know, WWE got sued and, and was, was, uh, this suit was obviously very unsuccessful, um, but like when the football verdict came in and then the hockey case came and then the WWE case, which, you know, somebody copied it. I mean, it's going to be really easy for lawyers to go, look, these guys have already settled for $335 million. Um, and we can do an identical suit with involving WWE. And if we get, even if it takes us 10 years and we end up with $335 million, for the lawyers and for the wrestlers, you know, I mean, it's it's worth it. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it if that if they do the same settlement. We've already seen the company would settle if that and and with and in the and in this case, it would probably be even more different because I don't think that as we saw with the MLW suit, the MLW suit they settled before discovery, so it actually wouldn't take that many years. I mean, the MLW case was, what, two years before they settled? A year and a half? Wasn't that long. So you could look at it that way that, like, look, like with the uh, the TKO case, you know, with the UFC, I mean, they went through discovery and they went through everything like that. And it all came out um, with, we've already seen with the MLW case that they don't want discovery and they don't want everyone's emails looked at, you know, everyone of Paul Levesque's emails and everyone of Nick Khan's emails and everything that involves anything dating back 20 years or whatever, um, you know, whenever, whenever they want to start this thing. So, I mean, it's like it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically somebody else can look at this and go like, look, we already have the precedent. And, and again, it's probably maybe in two years we could get some money out of this. So, there's that. There's another. That's the other aspect of it that is the potential, um, and you know we're gonna know more. You know we'll know more in like thirty to forty five days. We'll know if there's anything else. But yeah, it's so weird because it is three hundred thirty five million dollars, and it does feel. Um, I mean, almost everybody when that number came out was like, "Is that's it?" Um, but you know, if you're gonna be, you know, again, if you're gonna be someone who's a lawyer looking out of the outside and collect. These lawyers made so much money, and uh, these guys aren't going to go to court. I mean, they're not. And looking at the MLW case, like I said, they're not even going to want to go to discovery. So it's not like it's going to take 10 years. So that's the situation. There's a lot more to the story. It's a pretty big story. I mean, it's a, it's a it's still a giant settlement. But is it a game changer for the MMA industry, which some had hoped for? Probably not. Um, I think that's pretty much the consensus feeling right now is that it's not. Um, we don't know everything yet, but, um, you know, that's kind of where it stands. Well, uh, Philly Tom's going to be on the show tomorrow, and uh, I don't think he'll know too much more tomorrow, but we'll talk about the lawsuit with him and get his thoughts on it. But if he went online today, just one fighter after another, am I getting money? What's going on here? Yeah, well, because essentially know. the way it was, you had to opt out. And, and, if, and no, if you no, did and not opt out, almost nobody opted out. You didn't need to do anything. You just you did nothing, and you were part of this class action settlement. So I think right, that so it's, it's there are a lot fighters. of fighters that you know they're they're involved in this. They're getting money. They don't know what's going on. They don't know how much. They don't know anything. So well, no, 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 no. And that, that, again, that will probably start coming out in thirty to forty five days, and um, it'll be interesting. I mean, both sides have claimed. I mean. UFC or the the UFC side has kind of claimed victory in, in a sense because their stock price went up because I think by my estimate their stock price went up by about nine hundred million dollars on the day they owe three hundred million dollars 
So, so uh, clearly the stock market saw that as a, a good thing, that this thing was settled for only $335 million. Yeah, yeah. Ronda Rousey today did an interview and buried, well, actually the entire company, but in particular, she buried uh, Bruce Pritchard, John Laurinaitis. She said they could go fuck themselves. She said the WWE was an absolute shit show. She said that uh, they couldn't hold her hostage and not let her talk anymore. And she also revealed that one of the reasons that she retired was due to multiple concussions, which started when she was doing judo, and she hid them for a long time because she wanted to keep competing. So apparently she's been getting concussions, you know, starting in her judo career, probably through UFC, Well, she's cer- probably certainly WWE get, as well. Cer- certainly in the Holly Holm fight and the uh, Amanda Nunes fight, she could have gotten a concussion in, in, in those fights for sure. And she said that they had a complicated history with talents getting concussed, and she felt she couldn't talk about it. That's a really interesting. That's a really interesting statement. It sure is. Yeah. Well, didn't I mention mean, anything about Vince. Didn't mention anything about Paul Levesque. Didn't mention anything about Nick well, Khan. She um, she mentioned. I mean, in her book, she certainly mentioned. In the book, Vince. she did, but not in the interview. Yeah, yeah. In her book, she definitely mentioned Vince. Um, and um, yeah, it's uh, it's a, it's. Interesting. Um, you know, basically in, in her book, she, you know, talks about the plight of women, you know, in WWE. And it's all accurate. You know, I mean, they used to do bra and panties matches and they were probably, you know, kicking and screaming that they had to stop. And basically that the casting couch and everything that you've heard, you know, that people got pushes based on perhaps who they were sleeping with and, ba- you know, basically just, you know, ripped on. You know, not, not and and again, not saying it's so much now because again, women have a lot more leverage now because they are a much bigger part of the show, and the audience reacts to them as wrestlers and athletes. Whereas before, you know, the women were there to parade around in bikinis and whatever. You know what I mean? That's they were there. It's basically a bikini show in a lot of ways. Um, with you know, and trying to teach some of them to wrestle a little bit enough to do a short match and things like that. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, they got a bad history. Um, present isn't so bad, though. In comparison, it's it's worlds better um, than it was 10 years ago, even. But, um, you know, but again, like one of the things that's been talked about in the Vince lawsuit situation is, is that the same people, or not all the same people, but many of the people who were there during that period and many of the people who came from the old wrestling business are still there and you know i mean they're whatever you know that that's and if you want to you know uh clean out if but i don't think anybody wants to clean out i mean i think that's you know basically they they want you know vince out um vince is out lauren ice is out and that's where they think they want the buck to end is with with those two um and you know kevin dunn's gone um you know, and that's on his own volition, but it's possible that something here could have, uh, you know, led to his name getting out. Maybe, maybe not. But, um, um, you know, the, you know, and then obviously there's, uh, um, uh, Nick Khan's name and, and, uh, Brad Blum's name as far as the lawsuit goes, but there's nothing implicating. I mean, like we, people can assume a lot of different things, but there's nothing implicating that they knew anything more than, um, you know, Vince had these things, and and they really were. You know, I mean, the the attempt was to keep Vince out, and they really were powerless to do it. I mean, you could have said that they should have quit. You know, as as members of the board to protect the company, um, and some did. Some members of the board did quit, and some, the others did not. So this is her new book. She had uh, my fight, your fight, which was the first one. This one is called Our Fight, and uh, presumably. Is this the one you read? What? The the brand new one? I haven't read the new book. Okay. No. All right. So uh, that I don't presumably have, I, I don't, has I don't, I don't even have a copy of it. A lot about her WWE career. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I mean, she, it's interesting. I mean, she was friendly with Stephanie McMahon and not too many others in the company. I mean, I mean, there's, you know, Shayna, Natalia, 
Paul Heyman, there's probably a couple of others, um, you know, that she was friendly with. But as far as management went, I mean, she was not uh, friendly with Vince McMahon and uh, Bruce Pritchard. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, but one of her tweets made that very clear before. But, um, you know, and again, the lawsuit, which she's aware of, obviously, you know, if, if you think of Ronda Rousey and her background and her mindset and her reading this lawsuit, um, you know, it's pretty easy to see she's going to be infuriated by by that lawsuit. I mean, most women, most women were pretty repulsed that read it. You know, I mean, including in the company. I mean, it wasn't like people were looking at that thing and, and trying to like, I mean, there are, you know, obviously there are people in the company who looked at that thing and, you know, the first thing they try to do is defend him or this and that. But, uh, you know, a lot of people did not try to defend him at all, you, you know, within the company. I mean, people who were even in a situation where they've been defending other people in the company to me. Um Nobody bothers to try to defend Vince to me. You know, I mean, it's almost like they've thrown in the towel on him. It's like he's gone and we can't even try to defend him. But, I mean, just imagine, um, you know. Well, in the case oh, of Vince, I mean, I mean, those text messages. I oh, mean, yeah. There, there's no, like, you can, you can speculate about this person. You can speculate about that person. But we don't. What we do know is those text messages are real. And oh yeah, they're they're impossible to defend. They're, you know, Vince is impossible. To, I've said it from the start. Vince is impossible to defend here, and Laurinaitis too. You know, I mean, he's going to try to defend, saying he was the victim and everything. But I mean, there's enough there with him and Priors and everything. You can't defend him either. Um, you know, so that's the situation. But yeah, um, I'm sure if I mean, I mean, I would presume that she had finished her book before the lawsuit came out. Uh, but if she didn't, and that's in there, I can just imagine uh, what would she would say about the lawsuit. You saw the uh, finals of the New Japan Cup. I saw a lot of the New Japan Cup. I saw the whole show today. Um, boy, I watched a lot of wrestling today. Um, there was a lot of wrestling. Uh, yeah, no kidding. Um, so, I mean, the undercard was nothing. I mean, um, there was nothing really that great on the undercard i mean uh, um as far as the tournament matches i mean the um i mean the two like i think i mentioned before the two real good ones that i saw and and um were uh, yoda suji and jeff cobb which i think was the best match of the tournament uh, that match was awesome and maybe um yuya urimura and shingo takagi was um probably the second best i mean it was actually better technically as far as wrestling goes but Taiji, Asuchi, and, and Cobb was more dynamic in other ways. But, I mean, as, as far as today's show go, you know, as the undercard, you know, everything ranged from average to kind of good. Um, I think the best may have been um, Zack Sabre Jr. and Mikey Nichols against uh, Callum Newman and Jeff Cobb. And um, Callum Newman is uh, someone who's going to be one of the best wrestlers in the business very soon, if he isn't already. Um the guys, like, really, uh, you could look out, you know, up for, you know, as far as theirs. You know, Gabe Kidd and Callum Newman, um, as far as young guys. I mean, they're really freaking good. Um, they did and they did a couple of angles. Tangaloa and Great O'Conn were in a uh, six-man. And uh, like Tangaloa, Ishii, and Ryusuke Taguchi against Great O'Conn. TJP and Akira. TJP and Akira are really freaking good. They always are, though. And um, But they're going to have um, Tangaloa and Great Okan going for the uh, King of Pro Wrestling title uh, relatively soon. And then uh, uh, Sabre and Nichols uh, beat uh, Cobb and Newman when Nichols pinned Newman. Tenzon is back from knee surgery. Oh, my God. He is so slow. And upper body-wise, it's just like... You know, he's had all that nerve damage in his upper body, so he has very little power in it, although, you know, he could do suplexes and stuff. And he's, he's just if you like, you remember Tenzon from, from even, even two years ago, he's, he's just, his shoulders are just so small now. He looks kind of frail and old. He's not that old, but the injuries have made him look that way, and he's so slow moving. I mean, he should, I don't think he should be in the ring. He did not look good. Um, they um let's see the um 
Yo and uh, Yoshinobu Kanemaru had a singles match. It was a good match. Not great or anything. Um, you know, Yo won with an O'Connor roll. And uh, Yo came out with the IWGP junior belt that he stole from Sho. Uh, Sho was the champion. Sho was interfering in this match constantly. I mean, there's so much. I mean, one of the things is, is like, there were so many House of Torture matches on this show. I mean, like, one is, like, bad, but when it's, like, three and you have the referee bumps in every one of them and the low blows and the foreign objects, man, it's just like I can see where New Japan is 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 just not as much fun to watch as it used to be when you watch the whole show. I mean, the sporadic great matches, they're fantastic, you know, and, and, and as good as anything anywhere. But, you know, because you got, you know, again, even losing Okada and Osprey, who were two of their best, maybe even their two best, you still got, you know, Shingo Takagi. And... Maybe their two best. Shingo Takagi's awfully good. He is awfully good. Yeah. But, uh, talking yeah. Okada and Osprey right now. Yeah. He may be better than um, Okada right now. I wouldn't say he's better than Osprey. Um, and they still got um, Ishii. They still got, you know, a lot of, they got a lot of good wrestlers there. Um, so, um, okay, so, so anyway, um, Naito Shingo Takagi uh, wrestled Evil and Dick Togo, and, um, you know, the, um, uh, it was, uh, Naito gave, we used a low blow and jackknife cradle on Dick Togo, but the, um, the big thing was Evil and Shingo Takagi are going to be wrestling for the um, Never Open Weight title. So that's coming up. Probably these matches are probably going to be on the uh, April sixth uh, um, Sumo Hall show. Show and Yo for the Junior Heavyweight Title will almost certainly be on that show as well. And the main event will be um, Naito defending the IWGP World Title against Yodosuji, who won the tournament. And um, do I... Well, that is interesting because we have got their title match coming up, him and Naito, and it takes place shortly before Wendy City Riot. So essentially, the main event of that show, which has been advertised for a long time and has sold a lot of tickets, is Naito and John Moxley, which means we've got multiple things that could happen right here. We could have Suji win the title, and then Naito and Moxley is just a match. Yep. We could have Naito retain the title, and then Moxley and Naito is a championship match. Yes. Which, theoretically, Moxley could win. Yeah, I I wouldn't rule that out at all. I I, I especially bring that up because they're not in that uh, tag tournament. And Mm -hmm. I can't think of any reason for them not to be in that tournament other than we don't want to beat John Moxley, and we're not going to be able to beat John Moxley for a while. Um, I've actually asked about that, and... uh, Nothing. One has nothing to do with the other. Well, why um, are they not in the tournament? Because they weren't booked for the tournament. I think it's to keep why them... weren't they booked for the tournament? Um, Obviously, they have, weren't I... booked. Why? Why did they win that match at the pay per view and not not get booked for the tag team title tournament? Perhaps because whoever wins the tag team tournament, that's going to be the the next program. That actually makes total booking sense. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does, bro. They beat I know FTR. Say, I, know, I know, I know, I know. They beat know. them. Clean okay. in the middle of the ring, and FTR is okay, in the you're... tournament, and they're not. Okay, that's, that's So that totally doesn't different. make sense. No, 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 no. It doesn't make logical sense, but it makes... Well, book- yes, of course. But, it, but it, makes, it makes wrestling booking sense in the sense that you have this team, and you don't want to beat them in the tournament, so therefore you keep them out of the tournament, and then, they're, and then they can go well, in there. if you wanted it, to make booking sense, they shouldn't have beaten FTR. Who then no, got into the tournament? No, because it sets them up for the tur- for the championship match later. Dave, that's all fine and good. I think this is ridiculous. Okay, I I would agree with you to at, at, the at winning one level. team on pay per view yes. isn't in the tournament for the tag team title. Of course, but this the makes losing no, team is. Of course, this makes no sense. Okay, of course, thank okay, you. it makes no sense. However, in pro wrestling booking, which often makes no sense. You would do that. There's many, many, many examples of that wrestling history. No, no. What you would do, Dave, is 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 I'm they would not have th- beaten FTR. Yes, they Somebody would Somebody else could beat FTR. No, they would have beaten FTR because you're setting up a championship match later, and you don't want to beat them in the tournament, and then you have that. It's a uh, tournament for the tag team titles. Yes, but this has been done dozens and dozens of times in wrestling history. I'm not saying that it makes perfect sense because it doesn't. I'm just saying that it has been done by Eddie Graham and it has been done by many other promoters that are regarded as great bookers. Well, you know, great exactly bookers make bad decisions have, have sometimes. Done, what if they made money with it? 
I'm sure they could make it's money. It's about with making it. money. It's not about anything else. Wrestling has always been about making money first and foremost. That's it. That's it. Once you start, you know, you start doing this stuff where you start going, like, getting into the minutiae of everything. And at the end of the day, <laughs> the minutia, all of these, all of these a rules. tag team match on pay-per-view. Uh, no, I, under, I agree with you, but you're missing the point. What is wrestling about? Wrestling is about, it's not about making sense. It's about making money. Okay, that's the first thing you learn. And if you have a way that doesn't make sense, but it makes money, that is what a wrestling promoter will do because that is what you're taught to do. So I'm giving you a scenario which has happened many, many times in wrestling. And if it makes money, then it makes sense. If it makes money, it makes sense. And that's the rule of wrestling. The rule of wrestling is not A beats B and B beats C. That's all nice and well and good. But I've seen a million examples of booking historically. And WWE, a perfect example of over the years, has never. And one of the reasons why, and you can argue it's one of the reasons why match results don't matter in WWE. Well, yeah, that's whatever. bad. It, it can be bad. But what if you make more money? What if you have scenarios that make more money? Well, you know, I think you could make money with BCC going to the finals of a World Tag Team Championship tournament. As and well. then losing, and then what do you have? They don't lose, they win the titles. Then, then they can they... feud with FTR, or whoever. They can't feud, um, that's only if you keep FTR out of the tournament, because FTR would lose when we have the exact same scenario. Well, FTR honestly should be out of the tournament, because BCC beat them at the Okay, paper. well, they decided to do it this way. Yes, they did. And so, I, still I mean, there's many different there's many different scenarios, but I mean, as far as I mean, I specifically asked why they weren't in and there was like no reason. It's not like and again, even if they were in the tournament or whatever like that, I mean, you could still be Claudio. I mean, that they just didn't put him in because whatever reason they didn't put him in. Well, the rest of this Windy City show has Hiromu and Mustafa Ali, Ishii and Nick Nemeth. Jack Perry and Shota Ishii, Umino. Ishii, by the way, Ishii and Nick Nemeth also could be a global championship match. Could be, yeah. Um, depending on... N Nemeth will be, probably be defending the global. Well, he will be defending it on the April 6th show. So both of these matches, as far as if the titles are at stake, will be determined. I don't know who... Nemeth was going to face Tanahashi, but Tanahashi's ankle isn't going to be ready by then. So he's... I don't know. Maybe I'll face Finley. Um, Finley makes sense. Finley was sick, though. Um, so anyway, go ahead. And we've got a Hikaleo and El Fantasmo versus three unnamed teams for the strong open weight titles. Those are to be determined. And we have Eddie Kingston and three partners versus Gabe Kidd and three partners. I have no idea why they don't have Eddie Kingston against Gabe Kidd in a singles match. Because they did the, the no contest in San Jose, which was a hell of a match. And it's like... There's no reason to not bring the, you know, why would you do a no contest if you're not going to bring them back in a singles match? I guess they could do this, this multiple person match and then bring them back in a singles match. And, um, you know, if, if nothing else, um, Eddie Kingston's still going to have the, um, New Japan Strong title. So they could have uh, defended the New point, Japan, yes. they could have defended the New Japan Strong title, um, on this show. This is a Riot Rules Tornado tag. So maybe they just want something totally, completely wild. And well, hey, King, you know, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Kingston, Gabe Kidd was completely wild. Well, Gabe can pin Eddie here and then set up a title match if they want to. They could do that they because do it that. is a sure. multi-person wild tag match. Okay, so anyway, the um, uh, the 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 Goto and uh, Yotosuji match, which uh, Yotosuji won, so they're going with Naito and Yotosuji, um, which was interesting because they pushed so hard, Goto winning this thing for his father. Um, they had a great match. Um, no, not match of the year or anything like that, but um, one of the best matches in the tournament. And um, Goto, I mean, it's like he didn't do any what I would call great moves or anything, but Hiroki Goto had a hell of a match. I mean, he was just in the right place, in the right time. Um, Suji's got all the charisma and everything, and he's very good, but there's also weakness in his game, and Goto did a great job of... Um, being the veteran, essentially, working with the guy who's, you know, I mean, he's been in for a couple of years, but he's not fully experienced. But, um, you know, he, I thought they had a hell of a match. Yoda uh beat him with, uh, you know, really good, really good last five minutes, especially, but really, really good match. And Yoda Suji beat him clean with the Gene Blaster, which is basically a rugby tackle spear type deal. And two of them, actually. And, um, you know, clean win. 
And then Naito came out and they talked and basically that's the main event for Sumo Hall. And it's, um, I mean, it's an interesting match. It's probably, I mean, if you're looking at uh, which would draw more, Naito against Suji or Naito against Goto, I mean, Naito and Suji wins by a, a landslide. So they picked the match to draw. And um, they, you know, I don't expect Suji to win the title. I would, I would more expect Moxley to win it rather than Suji. But um, they, did, I mean, they did use the tournament to elevate Suji. They had to, you know, they've got, you know, whether it's Shota or um, Uemura or um, whatever Narita, and you know, they had to really elevate one of them. And if you're going to pick one, even though Uemura is the best wrestler of them of all of them, the um, Suji's the one with the charisma. So they picked the right one. So, um, you know, overall, um, I, I would say it was a great tournament from what I saw. Uh, but I think it was a good finish. And again, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, Goto advanced on a forfeit over Finley, and I don't know what would have happened there if, uh, you know, Finley hadn't been ill and taken out. Maybe Finley would have gone to the finals, which um, would have been different. I actually think that it ended up being a better match with Goto and with the Goto story. Um, it just it, it it really helped the match. I also was going to say that um, uh, the announcing, which was uh, Walker Stewart, uh, Gino Gambino, and um, uh, Chris Charlton, hell of a job. Um, three very different people in the booth. Gino Gambino's got this great low key sense of humor. It's just a really really quick wit, kind of like um, man, I don't know, like a Bobby Heenan. I don't, you know, that you know. Maybe that's unfair to, to compare because Bobby Heenan was in a different league from everyone when it came to that quickness. But Gino Gambito, I mean, he, he would say things that would crack me up constantly. Um, while not being comedian and not detracting and not detracting from the story or the announcing or anything, um, Walker Stewart has really gotten good with the X's and O's. You know, it's like he, he knows everything and he, you know, as far as the moves, He's learned the characters, and he um, he's getting good at the storytelling. I mean, he's imp you know he's really good. And Chris Charlton, you know, he's just got the historical knowledge, and um, he's another one. He's just very quick on his feet. It's a really good. If you listen to that English announcing, I mean, they tell you the whole story of everything. I mean, you can not even like be paying attention to the tournament and just watch the final match, and you will get into the whole story of the entire tournament. And the final match, um, easily with these guys. They did a great job in the main event. All right, who's staying and going from stardom? All right, well, they, um, let me get my uh, stardom thing. Hold on. Um, so they, they announced the uh, show on April the 4th in Philadelphia. So from this, because everyone that's going is going to be gone at the end of March, in just a couple of days, actually. So these are the names that we know are staying, because um, they're going to be in Philadelphia. It's Micah, who's the World Stardom Champion, who obviously, because she beat Utami Hayashida to retain the title today, on today's show, in, um, uh, where was today's show? Nagoya, I believe. Um, uh, Tam Nakano, which we knew was staying. Saya Kamatani, which is interesting, because I don't know that, I don't know that we knew that she was staying. And there's also there's a lot of people who had committed to leave um, that are staying. So that's an interesting thing. Saki Kashima, Mayu Iwatani, who we knew because she's under contract for another year, although she was not happy with what happened to Rossi Ogawa. A year from now, who knows? I mean, I, like right now, people think that she's going to leave in a year. Um, you know, in a year, like I said, who knows? Who knows? Um, things change a lot. Uh, Momokogo, Azumi, which is a, a good... Azumi is a good one that they got to stay because she's so talented and young and great future. Starlight Kid, uh, May Sierra, Konami, Saki, uh, Siguri, Shuri, uh, Momo Watanabe, Mina Shirakawa. Um, so they're all staying. Shuri is, is probably, to me, the biggest surprise because I did not expect her to stay. Um, and she is, and then uh, also on that uh, Philly show, they're going to have Stephanie Vacare, you know, who's the uh, New Japan Strong Women's Champion. So kind of Mar Mariah May and Willow Nightingale are coming in from uh, AW, and Zaya Brookside, who has been 
on some shows. So the key names, obviously, Julia and Utami are going to be the two big names. Um, Suzu Suzuki and Nanai Takahashi are probably the others. And I think that the, uh, I think that within the next month or so, um, we'll have the main stars. I mean, these are probably the main stars, but probably a, a fuller roster for the Rossi Ogawa promotion will probably be um, more obvious, but not not right away, but probably within within a month from now, I expect. So uh, that's kind of where it all stands. All right, uh, Terry Gordy. Yeah, I saw the dark side of the ring thing. Um, I mean, they had his his nephew, um, Richard Slinger, uh, Richard A. Slinger. They had his son and daughter, Amanda Gordy and Ray Gordy. Um, it was interesting because Ray Gordy, you know, who was uh, Jesse with Jesse and Festus with them. Uh, uh, Festus, of course, being now uh, Luke Gallows um, years and years ago in WWE. And he said that, you know, it was when he was there, he did not want to be Ray Gordy because he knew that he absolutely could not compare with Terry Gordy and did not want to use that name for that reason. Although Miranda Gordy uses that name. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's the Terry Gordy story. I mean, I think that, you know, I've kind of talked about it already um, as far as the main stuff. I mean, he's a great worker. And then, you know, he had the the drug overdose. And Mick Foley was on very good with a lot of, um, you know, a lot of different stories. One that was kind of heartbreaking was um, they had brought him in as the executioner in WWE and, you know, Undertaker pretty much, you know, said it's not going to work. And they killed it off pretty quick. Um, but um, it was funny because they tried to say that the reason that they put him as the uh, the executioner rather than Terry Gordy was to protect the name of Terry Gordy, um, which, I mean, it, it sounds really good that WWE was so magnanimous to do that, but that wasn't the reason at all. Um, but it sounds good today, I suppose. Um, but, I mean, as far as, um, you know, again, through the whole thing, Cornette was on it, and, you know, he's very good. He know, Obviously, that's history that he's going to know. Um but I thought Foley was very strong in 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 talking about their uh, death match thing and trying, you know, like the hope was he's going to make it, he's going to make it, he's going to in time figure it all out. He's going to go back to being Terry Gordy, and just the sad part that it it just was at one point you just had to realize that it just wasn't going to happen. But one of the sad things was, I guess, and I didn't even know this was when um, he was in WWE as the executioner, like, he would, like, just wander out and get lost at times, you know, leave the hotel, and they'd have to go down the streets and look for the guy because he was so lost. Um, and he also told a story about that they were on an airplane, and some woman who was sitting next to Terry Gordy took some pills, you know, just get probably prescription pills or whatever, and Terry just asked if he could take pills, not having any idea what they were. He just wanted to take pills and how... Just how sad that was for for Mick Foley, and uh, Jimmy Garvin was another one who was on it, and Michael Hayes was not on it, and um, you know, I mean, I know why, obviously WWE, but it's, I just, I don't know when they're doing like a, a Kevin Von Erich was also on it, by the way, and very good, but I just think that like, you know, there's there's a time when promotional things. I don't know, should kind of take a back seat. Like, it's like, if I'm watching a thing on Terry Gordy, I mean, obviously it's great that his kids were on, okay? But the person in wrestling most associated with Terry Gordy would be Michael Hayes. I mean, Steve Williams, they had interviews with Steve Williams on it, who, you know, passed away, but old interviews, um, talking about the situation and, and how Steve Williams basically had, had told told the whole story of the flight, you know, about, um, cause he was on the flight with him when he OD'd and basically he was doing CPR on him to keep him alive on the flight before they could land and get him to the hospital, which is, which is details that I had never heard before. And also Steve Williams talked about how this was not the first time this happened. I mean, I remember, I remember once, um, I was in Japan 
um and it was uh you know the the crew had arrived you know like uh, for the tour and um i was at the hotel and um i'm trying to remember you know who the you know with all the foreigners essentially and tenru was there and some others were there and um you know fumi was there and fumi and terry gordy were good friends and i knew terry i mean i wouldn't i was not friends with terry gordy but i had on other tours had been around Terry Gordy and, and stuff. And I think like Fumi was like, Hey, let's go get Terry Gordy. And, you know, I think the basic thing was, is that, you know, Terry Gordy would get so, um, I don't know, loaded, I guess is the term on the flight. You, the guys would arrive when, when the guys came to Japan as a general rule in those days, they would come, you know, like a little over a day before. So they have one day kind of to rest off, and then the next day is your first night of the tour. So he would he was so loaded that he couldn't even get out of his hotel room, and it was just kind of said, oh, yeah, 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 Terry Gordy after the flight, you know, for one day he's gone type of a thing. But, but which is really sad in hindsight, remembering that story. But Steve Williams talked about how there were other times where, you know, he would like, like, Gordy would be on the flight and he would be out and Steve would s said how, you know, he'd have to slap him and get him, you know, he says like, I would slap him around and then he would wake up, you know? And he said like this time, the, t the time that he OD'd badly, it's like I was slapping him around and, and he wasn't getting up and he was dying on him. And that's when he, you know, everyone on the flight panicked and they, you know, had, you know, they rushed him to the hospital and everything. And, you know, whatever happened, you know, he was, shut down for long enough that he obviously had brain damage to the point that, um, you know, he could never be the same. Unfortunately, he was never the same. He was so instinctive with wrestling that he actually could wrestle, you know, like, I mean, I wouldn't say good at all. It wasn't good. It was very slow, but he actually could sort of still do it, you know, at a, at a, at a sort of bad level, I mean, not a main event level or anything like that. But, um, yeah, you know, I mean, um, it's too bad. I mean, the guy, let's face it, the guy was, was great when he was 17 and 18. And, um, he was only, I think, 32, maybe 33 when this happened. So he had many, many good years left and, and a great career in Japan that he would have had, you know, had this not happened. So, um, you know, I'm very sad for his family. And, you know, they, you know, and obviously died at 40, or 40, I think it was. So, um, you know, just it was it was a sad story. All right. Uh, before we do AW and uh, Rampage and Dynamite tonight, uh, let's take a quick look at the ratings. Yeah. So a couple of notes, I guess, from from SmackDown. The one thing was, is that um, while while the, the ratings pattern was pretty much what we expected, the segment with the rock with the rock concert was. It did two million four hundred sixty thousand viewers and and uh, nine fifty nine thousand and eighteen forty nine. The eighteen forty nine number is very good, but the total viewer number um, it was much much lower than the quarters that he'd been on. Every one of them on SmackDown the whole run, um, he was on first, but it it just yeah. I mean it whatever it was, it didn't pop the quarter at the level. It was, I mean there was a. Well, it was there, weird too because it was like he he did the first two quarters. And then they had a big drop off, but then it came back. Yeah, but the thing is, is that his two quarters were again they were not they were they were under two point five million, and his quarters have been doing two point eight million, two point you know in that range. So it was much lower than before. I mean, it's still above average, you know, and still above normal. Um, but the rating for the show, you know, like the final rating for the show is like what they were doing before he was even there, and even on shows without Roman Reigns, they were doing numbers similar to this. So, um, I mean, as far as total viewer number, so, um, I mean, there was, um, you know, obviously we're, we're in the thick of basketball and everything, you know, college basketball. So, and there was a lot of competition, but still I would say, you know, I mean, based on what we've seen with rock that rocks done, um, it had to be considered disappointing. I mean, if anyone else did those numbers, I wouldn't call it disappointing, but for him, Standards are so high that I would I would say that. So, um, Collision was uh, three hundred and ninety three thousand viewers and zero point one two, which is 
uh, below usual, you know, for a show that did not go against on the same day as a WWE show. But there was, again, also, um, you know, this is Saturday. Saturday had even more competition than Friday. There was um, a lot of different things there. The, um, um, what was it? The, um, I mean, head-to-head as far as, like, you know, between 8 and 10, I mean, the only thing that really beat them was, um, what was it, uh, the ESPN covering uh, um, college basketball and then um, On Patrol Live um, on Reels beat it by a little bit. And um, there were two Big Bang Theory reruns on TBS of the four that beat it and two didn't beat it. But um, so... Um, I mean, as far as placing goes, it, it was, you know, fourth. Um, but still, you know, lower number than usual. Um, the Danielson Shibata, I believe, was the high point. Um, do I have that even here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was not the, okay, I, I, it was the high point in total viewers. Um, and um, was the, yeah, it was the, um, the, Overrun with the Adam Copeland promo did beat it in 1849. So they actually, um, uh, Adam Copeland uh, brought the audience back at the end. You know, it, it fell from the Danielson Shibata, you know, for the Julia Hart match and Daniel Garcia, Lee Moriarty, and Claudio and Archer, which I would have expected all of that. And then, but it did come back, Kyle O'Reilly and Brian Keith as well. But it did come back with, um, came back with the Adam Copeland promo and uh, did pretty well there then um raw was uh one million uh, uh, six hundred eighty seven thousand viewers 0.55 down from last week but uh that cody quarter yeah great holy quarter. shit it shot straight up yeah 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 they did so they did um the cody quarter did uh one Two million. million one million nine hundred and eighty thousand i know one million nine hundred sixty thousand and eight hundred forty-one thousand eighteen to forty-nine. They came back right after that with um, um, what was it? The uh, Ricochet Dominic Mysterio, and they dropped two hundred thirty thousand viewers during that quarter. And um, the one, the New Day in Otis and Tozawa, which was um, down five hundred and ten thousand viewers from the Cody quarter, and it was like. You know, 45 minutes later, um, they came back. Um, Becky Lynch and Nia Jax at one million five hundred eighty thousand. So that that was better. Now, now that we're in daylight savings time, the pattern will be a little bit different because we are going to get a lot more. I mean, the the, the peak is going to be hour two most weeks now. You know, before a lot of weeks it was hour one, and when the peak is hour two, that also means the drop off in hour three is not going to be as bad. So. That's the new. That, that will be the new pattern. It's not going to be the big drop off in hour three that we had, um, you know, just a couple of weeks ago. And then uh, NXT um, was five hundred eighty nine thousand and zero point one eight. So the zero point one eight is actually up um, from what they have been doing, and but the total viewers are down. So it's actually the youngest audience for NXT maybe that they've ever done. Because they were way down in over fifty viewers, but but up in eighteen to forty nine. So um, you know they were eighth on cable, fourth in the time slot. So that's that. And then as far as the week, SmackDown ended up fifth for the week, um, behind mostly basketball. Um, in fact, uh, was it all basketball and Survivor? And then. Um, um, what was it? Uh, Raw was second behind North Carolina, North Carolina State basketball, um, as far as cable went. And then um, AEW was 22nd, NXT was 94th. And then in the entertainment category, taking out all the sports, Raw was first, Vanderpump second, AEW Dynamite third. So when it came to placings, I mean, this is interesting. Last year, and this, this, this tells you about the decline in ratings overall on cable and things like that. Like last year, this week, was the Kenny Omega of Akingo episode of Dynamite, which was one of the higher rated episodes of the year. It did an 0.33. This year was down to an 0.27 for the same week. 
But um, as far as overall placings, the uh, Dynamite last year um, was, what was it? Um, Do I have that? Um, Dynamite last year was um, 43rd. This year it was 22nd, and in entertainment last year was fourth and this year was third so sometimes when we when we kind of get looking at this numbers if we start thinking like with our what we thought last year so to speak you got to realize that there's been a big drop across the board like a point two seven this year actually finished much higher in the standings than a point three three did last year so you know you've got to view cable as comparisons to what cable is doing not what it was doing when there were more homes, not when it was, you know, less people were streaming and things like that. And, and there's a big difference even a year ago between those numbers. So um, I guess that's that's a point that, you know, sometimes when people look at this stuff, they don't see that, um, that it's actually that this number actually placed higher than the number a year ago, even though the number a year ago was was more viewers and a higher 18 to 49 number by a significant amount even. All right, the uh, Dynamite and Rampage three-hour block. we got to talk about that here before we run out of time. So Mercedes did open up the show again, and they called her out for a promo, and she talked about her time in Japan. She had a video package she said she made, which was a nice video package, showed some Mandalorian stuff, modeling stuff, some New Japan footage, and she said, I got rocking and rolling, but then it got taken away. And she said, minor setbacks come with major comebacks. At one point, she didn't even know if she was going to be able to return. And she said she was not here to lead a women's evolution. She was going to lead a women's global revolution. She wanted to be the best woman in AW and all over the globe. So uh, she said, you know, about that attack last week, I have an issue with Willow. And if you guys mess with my business, you're going to be bankrupt. So the lights go out. Come back on, and Julie's in the aisle. Sky Blue hits the ring from behind. Mercedes takes out Sky. Julia grabs her, goes for a finish. Sky returns to make the save. They get chairs. They're going to take her out, but Willow runs down, and she makes a save with Statlander. And so the lights go out again. They come back on. The heels are gone, but Willow has the chair, and she's looking like she's about to hit Mercedes with it. Mercedes turns around. She drops the chair. They have words, and they leave. And uh, it's a good segment setting up what they're doing with all of these women. But I will say, if I had a near-career-ending ankle injury, you know what I would never do? Bunch of spots in high heels. Yeah. Mercedes she was, was in high- running around in these she high was, heels. She was in spots. high heels. She was in high heels. I was yeah. like, God, please don't do that. Yeah. Don't I, do that. I have my own issue that I'll get to later, but... Um, it was really interesting watching Mercedes and Will Ospreay tonight. And the reason is because Mercedes, when she came out, I mean, it's not, this is not right or wrong. It's just 180 degree different approaches. Okay. Mercedes came out and it was, it, I, the whole segment felt to me like WWE, which is not a dirty word. It just felt like WWE. She's out there doing her dance and doing her very practiced ring entrance. And she's doing a WWE promo with trying to hit certain words and everything. Very scripted like WWE. Of course, you know, Jen Pepperman, right? I mean, you know, it's like WWE writer probably wrote this promo for her. So, you know, it was like, it, it, like I'm watching this going like this feels very WWE, you know, very produced. Um, Will Ospreay comes out and it feels completely different. I mean, it's very, what I would say, New Japan without the swear words, in a sense that it's very authentic into the story. I don't know, you know, like, you can argue which is better, you know, like, some people want the realism and the sports, and some people want the show. But it was like, when I watched her, I'm going like, this feels just like watching WWE. Um, and, and when I watch AEW, I will say, and it is, it is feeling, there is feeling, it does feel more WWE-ish in the last couple of weeks, which is no surprise with Jen Pepperman in and other people in there that are 
you know, come in and their knowledge is is essentially of wrestling is WWE. So that's what it's going to, the stuff they're going to do is going to feel like WWE because that's what they know. Um, but when I watch AEW, it's like I, I think AEW, while you learn from WWE, absolutely should learn from WWE, if you copy WWE, somebody was already doing WWE, and it's WWE, and they're going to do it better than you because that's what they do. To be different, um, I think you want to be not WWE. You want to go in a different direction. Um, so, I mean, that was the one thing that, I mean, on the whole show that I really hit me was the segments that felt WWE um, and the segments that didn't, you know, and, and that's like the biggest contrast. I mean, Osprey was doing nothing like WWE, although WWE, I will say with WWE, WWE isn't even doing that old WWE as much because, you know, those that, that was more like the Vince McMahon type promo thing where it's all buzzwords and everything. Like if you watch Cody Rhodes and his promo, his promo was more like not WWE, but it's what's getting over in WWE because it's, again, more authentic and i think that the audience now does want the more authentic rather than the 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 overly produced you know talking in a certain way that's not really realistic but time will tell you know as far as you know and there's you can do both too we had okada eddie kingston for the continental title and as you would expect this was a very good match and also a very decisive finish as Yeah, Okada makes a big, or uh, actually it was Eddie that made the big comeback, and they traded some shots, and then crowds chanting for both guys, and then Okada raked his eyes, Aiden in Zagiri, Eddie goes for a back fist, Okada avoids it, slammed him, Rainmaker, pinned him, clean in the middle of the ring. He is the new Continental Champion, and uh, looks like Eddie is slowly losing these belts one at a time, because I do not expect him to beat Mark Briscoe. At the Ring of Honor pay-per-view for that ROH title. So it looks like Okada and Pac. Yep, Pac for, came for, out and uh, stared for, him down uh, afterwards. For probably uh, the pay-per-view, yeah. which is hell of a match. I mean, talk about that match, and you talk about Swerve and Joe, and you talk about um, um, whatever the tag team tournament finals, which might be FTR and Young Bucks, and then you got uh, Danielson and uh, Will Ospreay. Um it's got the makings of a hell of a show. Um, you know, probably um, Tony Storm and uh, Thunder Rosa, too. Yeah. We had Renee with Swerve and Nana, and uh, Swerve said he wanted a open challenge for later with a big man, he said. And then we had a segment with Willow, Statlander, and Stokely. We should mention that, that in the um, in the thing, um, on the, on, on the, in the original segment, Willow... Um, Looked like she was maybe going to hit Mercedes with a chair. We talked Mercedes about Mercedes turned around, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Mercedes walks up when they're doing this thing backstage, and Statlander thanks her for having Willow's back last week, and Mercedes says, well, thanks for having my back. It's nice to meet you. She goes to walk away, and Willow tries to say something, but Mercedes cuts her off, gets right in her face, and says, you've done enough, and she storms off. And uh, people really like Willow, and this was quite heelish. And Stokely tells Willow, "Ah, eh, what are you worried about her for? You broke her ankle. And this made Willow feel very bad. So this is going to be an interesting feud when they take probably the most beloved woman that they had before Mercedes got there and feuds her with Mercedes. It was supposed yeah. to be a baby face. Well, I mean, obviously, we, it looks to me like we're going to have Mercedes against Julia Hart and against Willow and maybe her first two programs. Yeah. We had Chris Jericho versus Hook and... This was kind of like, uh, almost like that Lesnar-Lashley uh, match where uh, Hook just suplexed him over and over, over and, and over. Yeah. He's like and Jericho suplexes. selling his neck. And, you know, at one point he actually did the exact same thing that, that Lashley did in that Lesnar match, which is he's about to take a suplex and he turned and he landed on his shoulder. I was yeah. worried about that one, but he seemed to be all right. And then finally Jericho hits a couple of his big spots. And they end up on the ropes. And it was kind of weird because Hook puts him in the red rum as they're fighting on the top rope. And Jericho starts walking to the middle of the ring, which in real life would make no sense because if he just stayed where he was at, the referee should have stopped it. But he goes to the middle, he collapses, but he fights his way free, hits a couple of forearms, 
goes for the walls, and Hook cradled him and pinned him. And let me tell you something. This was exactly the opposite of the House of Black versus the Infantry. It sure was. Because Jericho could not have put this guy over stronger. He gave him like 80% of this match, maybe more. Maybe more. Clean in the middle, one, two, three, got pinned, no fluke, no interference, nothing. The only thing is is that he didn't lose the choke, which is funny because the audience, when Jericho got out of the choke, did you notice that the audience, like they, they didn't boo Jericho during the match. They were They were cheering both guys. But when Jericho got out of the choke, they booed because I think that they thought, oh, my God, Jericho's not going to lose. I think that that's what they were thinking. And then Jericho got cradled, you know, basically seconds later. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I mean, this was – I almost thought he gave him too much since he was going to lose. It was almost, you know, like the Hobbs match in a lot of ways when, when Hobbs just ran through him. It's like, like Jericho's putting these guys over, and Jericho's like a big star. I mean – I'm not saying that like he needed like to do what the infantry match was. I mean God, anything no. but anything but because that doesn't get anybody over. But you know he could have done. Um, you know, I mean, if he's going to lose to the guy, you know, he could take more of the match and still. I mean, the guy's still going to get over for it. But I mean, I almost thought watching it because I, I mean. There was no reason to do the match unless Jericho was going to lose. I think everyone kind of understood that, that, that Hook was going to win the match. So when I'm watching the match, and I'm watching, you know, basically suplex and suplex and suplex and over and over. And, and it was almost like, I almost think that, that because people have been trying to do this thing of how Jericho never gets anybody over, which is kind of ludicrous, but people try to say that, um, that he was like overcompensating and going like, okay, I'm not just going to lose to this guy. I'm going to like give him the whole match. And that's what he did, you know? And I mean, it's like for Hook, I mean, it's like the biggest guy Hook's ever beaten. And it's the, you know, um, decisive. I mean, you know, you can't say, you can't say anything about not getting the guy over and not doing it the right way. If anything, it was too much of the right way. But the finish was what the finish was. Um, and I'll tell you what, I mean, I, I said this when, when Hobbs beat Jericho and they didn't really follow up on it that much. Um, and went to Kesha to beat Jericho, which, um, they are following up on a little bit. Um, you know, I mean, you can't, you know, you can't just drop it now. I mean, hooks. Well, listen, here's the thing. Mix with something. Here's the thing. When people say like, you know, there was a threat on a board. Who has Jericho gotten over? Okay. Actually, this is a pretty long list. Okay, but I actually but, think about but, 10 no. People. Here's the point. Here's the point. It is not Jericho's job to get them over after he puts them over. He's not the booker. If you're upset that Action Andretti is doing jobs and six mans on Collision or whatever, uh, this is Tony's company. Jericho went in there and he put the guy over clean. He, he went put, in he there put, and he, he put he, over Hobbs clean. He, he went over, in there. He put over Hook clean. Now it is the responsibility of the booker to follow up on these things. Yeah. What's Jericho going to do? He put the guy, he put Hook over. I'll tell you what. He's not like, booking the program from here on out. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's like Action Andretti did not end up as a big star. But, I mean, you could not have started him off any better no. than, than that match. Yeah, it did fall apart. But the lack of follow-up is not on Chris Jericho. He's That's not true. there booking Action Andretti's feuds going forward. He yeah, did but, what he did on that night. And then it's up to the follow-up, which is out of his hands, unless okay. it's a program that he's specifically booking. But okay. even then, once he's done booking his program, the guy goes on to whatever else. Now it's on Tony. Yeah. So, but the, the the negative is is that Jericho is a, is a big star, and if he puts somebody over, he should only put over people that are going to be big stars. Just putting people over random. It's like it doesn't. It, it's 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 not beneficial to the company to beat a million dollar player unless it's somebody that you're going to do something with. I mean, that's the role should be. It's like when when Jericho put over Fandango, okay, in WWE. If you remember that one, when it was you know like three months later, it's like why the hell did he do that? I mean, it's like what purpose did this serve? Fandango's like they're not even doing nothing with the guy, and that's the same thing I would say with. You know, with Andretti, I almost will go to this to the extent of saying, because it was actually such a great television moment 
that meant nothing later. But at that moment, that was actually like really super entertaining. And it was like really a, a great, you know, one of the great moments in, in a lot of ways because you didn't expect it to happen. But I mean, like with, with Hobbs, they haven't really, um, they haven't hurt Hobbs, but they haven't really helped Hobbs either. Like it's like he, you know, if you beat Jericho that strong, to me, Jericho should be enough of a star that if you're going to beat him, you, you know, he, the, the guy who beats him should probably be in line for a major championship match, especially when you got 41 championships. You know, it shouldn't be that hard. And like with Hobbs, really didn't happen. With Takeshita, like I said, with Takeshita, they are doing something with Takeshita, and he did go in there and have the big match with Will and all that. So there was a follow-up with, with him. Um, and with Hook, it's like, yeah, I mean, he is FTW champion and all, but, I mean, Hook should be going against somebody in a in a big major program right now um, following up. Or, um, you know, it's kind of like, okay, he lost, but didn't really accomplish anything if he doesn't, they don't follow up on it. Well, Jericho did do a promo afterwards, and he said that uh, this guy lived up to everything I thought, and next what, Wednesday on Dynamite... I have a proposition for you. Yeah. So I think they're going to be a tag team, would be my guess. Where they're going well, there. That's, that's, it's good to have another tag team that's not in the tournament that, that can be out there and go for something. We had the Will Ospreay promo with Tony. The place just went nuts for this guy. And he talked about Brian Danielson, who said on Collision that, uh, you know, Will hadn't walked in his shoes. And he said, you know, I went to Japan, a place where you wanted to be a big star. There were your shoes, and I couldn't believe it. There was no way I could fit, because, in fact, your shoes are too small. I did great things in Japan. You did great things, but I elevated pro wrestling. Won the best of the Super Juniors, junior title three times, openweight champions, junior championships, most importantly, the world title. But apparently, I can't walk in your shoes. Well, if you want me to prove it, next week, Katsuyori Shibata, long time no see. Seven years ago, I wrestled him. He beat the piss out of me, but I'm 30 years old now. I got a point to prove, and so he's going to take out Shibata next week. And uh, okay, so so before that, there was a, there was an Adam Cole interview, and he ran down Wardlow, um, you know, basically doing similar to what they've done before with Wardlow. You know, it looks like they're going to turn Wardlow babyface, basically saying that like you know, um, whatever you know that um, he was disappointed in him. You challenged Joe and you lost. You had one damn job and you failed at it. Now you have a new job. It's to make sure that Taven and Bennett always retain their tag team titles and make sure that Roderick Strong keeps his international title. And if you can do that, then we'll forgive you. But don't screw it up. So um, that's what it sounded like. So now the Will Ospreay Shibata match. Like it's so funny when I was watching the, the the Shibata match with Brian Danielson and Brian Danielson did such a great match. The first thing I thought of is, is, you know, I could really see a story where it's like Brian Danielson beat Shibata, so we'll have Will Ospreay beat Shibata. And it's like, I hope they don't do that. And the reason I say that is because, like, I'm kind of scared. I, I hope, like, Will, Will Ospreay does a lot of stuff to the head, so he's going to have to modify. And also with Will Ospreay, you, the, the guy he wrestles takes a lot of bumps. And Shibata has a different style. I mean, Will has got to do a, you know, like a, a Will, a normal Will Ospreay match. Shibata is not a good opponent for that. Now, I mean, granted, Shibata is very, very good at what he does, and Will Ospreay is very versatile. So this may work, but man, I don't see any hook kicks to the head or anything like that because, um, you know, some of the times he does that, you know, they, they, they hit pretty solid and it's not good for, uh, Shibata to take stuff into the head that's that's really hard so i'm kind of um you know like i don't know i just remember like when i was watching that uh, danielson match and i was thinking this exact match and i go god i hope he doesn't book will osprey with shibata but he did and hopefully it goes well we had um, tony storm and mariah may versus thunder and diana Parazzo, and uh exactly what you would think tony and mariah are super over Thunder Rose and Deanna are supposed to be baby faces, but the fans see Tony and Mariah as the baby faces. And then, you know, Tony makes a big comeback at the end, even though she's supposed to be a heel and they cheer for her. And then finally hits the hip attack in the corner, goes for a short pile driver, but Thunder swept the legs and pinned her. 
So it looks like Thunder is next in line for Tony. Deanna was all pissed off. Even though she won. At least they can turn Deanna heel. Cause yeah, it looks like they can turn Deanna heel because, because she, um, yeah, I mean, there's no reason for her to be pissed unless that's the case, yeah. Hey, if you have not watched this yet, everybody, rewatch this match and watch when Thunder Rosa and Tony Storm are brawling at the beginning of the match outside the ring. Tony Storm rears back and goes, bam! And she punched Thunder Rosa full on right in the face. And you could just see Thunder's just like, whoa, what just happened? And she starts holding onto her face and she goes to the corner. Man, she decked her in this match. Just punched her right in the face. We had Swerve versus The Butcher, who is in fact a big guy, and he beat him. And then afterwards, he cut a promo. He wants his title match with Samoa Joe. And so Joe came out. And uh, as he's doing the promo, he threatens to go beat up Swerve. But out comes Don Callis, who got massive heat. And Don Callis basically says, Swerve, you and Takeshita, if you take out, uh, you know, the matches in the uh, family, you guys have the same amount of wins. And so uh, you need to show what it's like to, uh, to lose to the family. It's not Swerve's house. It's Don Callis' family house. And Swerve says, well, you know what? I accept. I will take on Takeshita. And when I finish with him, I'm coming for you, Joe. So basically, you know, without Tony Khan or anybody, this is essentially a number one contenders match. Winner of this match is getting Samoa Joe. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, that's a good win for Swerve. You know, I mean, because Takeshita, even though he lost to Will, I think he gained from losing to Will because of the quality of the match. And, you know, Takeshita looked great in the match tonight with Rocky. And um, I think it's a, you know, I mean, they should have a great match. So I think that's a, I, th- I think that's a great television match to, to build up a guy for a world title shot. I mean, that's great. Um, the other thing that I thought was interesting was Don Callis being against Swerve because I could really see, you know, the idea of Swerve as a champion and Don Callis as a manager throwing guys out there. And then you know you could throw Hobbs out there, you know, and people like that. Um, and, um, you know, kind of like that, uh, um, you know, just like the, the manager bringing in different guys and it gets, um, it gets callous because, you know, callous first was doing the program with Jericho and, you know, they're kind of like not doing it now. And obviously the Omega thing, you know, that's on hold for a long, long time. So it kind of gives him something to do. And, um, you know, um, you could... I mean, you know, you could even have, you could do a Takeshi to win and not have it be for the, you know, not number one contender. And then, you know, Swerve wins the title and then Swerve goes with Takeshi. You could also book it that way. But, um, whatever, you know, I mean, it's, it's a good match because you can go, either guy can win and you have a good, you could have a good, it, 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 you can do a good story out of it. And, um, again, like with, uh, Callis and Swerve, it makes, Makes a lot of sense, you know, because Callis pretty much did in his promo um, a thing about, you know, he's going to be Swerve's big nemesis, and Swerve should be winning the championship. I, I think that that's like, no matter what, no matter what the results of any of the other matches, Swerve should win the title from uh, Joe, I think. It's just, the, it's just the right time for it. Adam Copeland, Christian, I quit match for the TNT title. So the first uh, two-thirds of this match was your basic I quid match, and they fought all over the place. They fought in the crowd. They put on jerseys and fought each other in a penalty box and right, right. It was a ladders. Maple, Maple Leafs jersey and the Boston Bruins jersey all for Christian. Of... And uh, with two planted fans, you know, yep. up there and everything. Um, these two guys are super smart. And so I knew that, like, they're, they would do a match with a lot of clever things, and this match had... A lot, a lot of clever things. I also thought it went... I I thought that they had too many ideas. Well, the end of the match got very convoluted because Copeland goes for a cross face with a stick and then he takes out his drawstring and he starts choking him to death with it. And so, finally, Nick Wayne and Killswitch hit the ring to make the save. Shayna gets in the ring, she slaps him. And then Daddy Magic and Daniel Garcia hit the ring. So there's like 50 people in the ring. And then they take out the heels and didn't, they end didn't up... Shane, didn't, didn't Shane a low blow him with a hockey stick? That was, yeah, to set up all of this. Yeah. So they, they end up in the ring and the baby faces uh, handcuff kill switch to one turnbuckle. They handcuff Nick to the other turnbuckle. Shayna bails and runs for her life. Christian's all alone with four baby faces. 
They pinball him around the ring. Edge hits a spear. They handcuff him to the corner. Adam finally goes into the ring. He gets his his barbed wire or his uh, board covered in spikes. Uh, spike. Yeah. And uh, he kicks Christian in the balls like a dozen times. Christian won't quit. He, he, gets, hits him, he hits him with a spike back. He gets the board covered in nails and hits him in the balls with a nail-covered board. Christian won't quit. Yeah. And so he threatens to hit him in the head with a board covered in nails, and then Christian quits. So I thought it was a little bit of overkill there at the end. It was, it was yeah, actually almost too. a cartoon. It was so ridiculous. I know. I thought it was overkill. But they thought, worked I, their asses off. I and, thought it was a great match, though. But, but yeah, yeah, very well-worked match and... I thought the excellent, excellent uh, dynamite. But I will say this: after this dynamite show, we had another hour of rampage. And brother, I don't care what TV show it is. This was, God, this was a long hour, and like it opens with the guns and and uh, Jay White cutting a promo and making fun of Darby and and challenging the uh, the acclaimed and daddy ass. And then, you know, Caster and Bowens come out for a promo. And, man, they... I mean, it was important to do a big promo because of what happened. But, man, it felt like they talked for 15 minutes. They just kept going on and on and on. And long story short, you know, they want to beat their asses. But they yeah, talked about it for, like, 15 minutes. Yeah, so they'll probably do that six-man match at the pay-per-view. Yeah. It's like... And, uh, and, man, it just felt long. And so then we had Hobbs and Fletcher versus Orange and Trent in a tag title tournament match. And uh, this is a very good match. Orange and Trent won. They're going to the yeah, really quarterfinals. It really was good. Yeah. The last the last half in particular was, like, really good. You know, uh, um, Kyle Fletcher is is tremendous. He's, you know, Trent, he's, Bar- Trent Barrett is super underrated. Um, kind of like, um, he's one of those guys that, like, he's always really good, but it's like he's... Never going to be a superstar. You know, he's just a guy that, but you can always count on him to put him in a TV match, and it'll always be entertaining because he works so freaking hard. And Orange, obviously, is, you know, Orange is super, you know, very, very over and everything. But, you know, Hobbs is fine, but the Kyle Fletcher, man, 25 years old, that guy can, that guy, when he's 30, man, he is going to be, he's going to be one of the best guys in the business. He's got, you know, he's getting bigger and bigger, and, um, you know, he was just on target. I mean, it's not his time right now, and that's fine. And he did the job, and that's fine because, you know, it's uh, they were, they were going against the winner of the match was going against the kingdom. So it kind of, you know, you kind of should have a babyface win. So it all made sense. And then we had Shibata beating Kevin Matthews with the PK, which was yeah, a fun, quick squash. Yes, yeah, like 90, eighty-one seconds actually. And then, you know, this is one of those weird things. We had Takesh and Rocky Romero. And, man, they worked so good. But at the end of the day, Takeshita is essentially doing a number one contenders match with Swerve on Dynamite. And, man, he gave Rocky Romero so much of this match. He did. He's just selling and selling and selling. And Man, that guy can sell, too. He can. He's, he's but my, really my point is, I think Takeshita should have got a match where he just smashed somebody. No, but they wanted to weaken his arm, so, so he had his out for when he loses. Well, I guess, but I mean, Swerve's the baby face, so we're having the heel go in with an injury. I mean, I but don't they're know. but but you're you're using you know in, in you're trying to you know they're trying to protect him. He also won with a tornado elbow with his alleged bad arm, so it's working just fine. And the spinning well, he was, but he, for but the, pin. When he, the difference is is that when he hit him, he just grabs the arm like it was like you know like he used it he used it twice, and both times he just grabbed it like. You know, it's like, ah, oh, I got, you know what I mean? I just like, you know, it's 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 my move, but man, my arm's like fucked. I mean, that was the whole that was the whole purpose of it. Then the main event was the women's street fight. And uh this is one of those things, you know? We're going to advertise a women's street fight and you are going to get a street fight with women. They beat the hell out of each other. They had thumbtacks. Julia Hart uh or not Julia Hart, uh uh, Sky Blue gigged and didn't get a lot of blood, but, I mean, she gigged, and they beat the hell out of each other. They had all sorts of weapons and, uh, and gimmicks, and, I mean, they, they worked very hard, and they delivered a uh, a street fight. So at the end, uh, there it's, it's Sky and Willow fighting on the announce table, and uh, 
And Sky Blue gives her the code blue in this table, and this fucking table did not budge. It was like she took a, a code blue on cement. It just was brutal. Fell on the ground. She's dead for a while. And so Statlander and, and uh, Sky get in the ring. They get the thumbtacks. Sky gave her a power bomb into the tax. And then she put the thumbtacks in Statlander's mouth, gave her the super kick. And finally, at the end, uh, Statlander goes for the 450. She misses. Julia puts her in Heartless. And Statlander submits. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe somebody would beat uh, the champion to set up a title match, but nope. Well, they're trying to uh, get Julia Hart strong for, for uh, Mercedes. Well, they uh, they got her over strong here. Yeah. So I thought for what it was, I mean, it was it was very good. They worked their asses off. But yeah, dude, three hours is just a long time for any wrestling show. Well, this is way over three because they went. Yeah, they, they, had a, they had a seven minute overrun. Yeah, they went seven minutes. Three long. hours and seven minutes. So, so a couple of things on this. Number one is, I don't know if this was for every cable system, but I know that for mine. Um, you know, I mean, I normally have uh, Rampage automatic, you know, automatically DVR'd, and it did not record Rampage. Mm. So I had to manually do that. And, you know, for people who, you know, I mean, um, you know, that's whatever. And they also went really long. So um, I expect that the Rampage hour, because some people will not be able to see it because their DVR did not record it probably a lot of people because um you know that 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 hour will probably be down more as relation to the dynamite out two hours than would normally be the case for that reason you know maybe um i don't know like the, the, the number of people who'd watch on dvr you know it's probably gonna hurt it about 10 percent probably all right, everybody. On that note, we are totally out of time. we got to wrap it up for today. But the New Observer is up on the front page. The back issue is up as well. And Dave and I will be up on Sunday? Um, yeah, Sunday. Yes, we have no Saturday pay-per-view. So we'll be up on Sunday. Dave and Garrett on Friday. And uh, New Observer out on Friday as well. So check it out. Lots of shows. Filthy Tom is on tomorrow. We'll talk UFC and plenty more. And that's it. We'll talk to you again after a while.